This is Jim McKeith, Developer Advocate for Embarcadero Technologies. And joining us today is Nick Hodges, our Director of Product Management. Hey, Nick. Hello, hello, hello. And he's going to talk with us about building microservices, what microservices are, how, how they work, and then walk us through building them with a RAD Server. So uh, if you have any questions as are going along, put them in the question panel and go to webinar, and I'll let Nick take it away. Thanks, Jim. Okay, so today we're talking about building microservices. And uh, the first question that pops into my head is, who is Nick Hodges? <laughs> and uh, this is a little uh, slide about me. I am the Director of Product Management for Embarcadero. I'm now the author of three Delphi books. I just recently released uh, Dependency Injection in Delphi. And uh, there's my blog and my email address. If you want to get a hold of me, please do. I'm always happy to talk to customers, always willing to do so, even if you have many complaints. So what is a microservice architecture? Well, this is a quote from the Martin Fowler's web page. Martin Fowler is often on the cutting edge of these kind of things, and he says that it's Microservice architecture, you can, well, you can read it here. It's an approach to developing a single application as a suite of small services with each service running in its own process and communicating with the lightweight mechanisms, often an HTTP resource API. So that's all Microsoft, Microsoft, the microservices are. There's basically a $25 term for a 25 cent definition. If you want to talk about microservices, though, the first thing you need to talk about is REST because microservices almost always are implemented as REST uh, connections. REST means representational state transfer, and then often you'll hear the word RESTful services to describe a web service philosophy that's built on HTTP and using the HTTP functions, get, post, and all those, as verbs to define how the code how the uh, service works. It's very basic client-server connectivity. It's stateless. It's cacheable. You, have, you can have layered systems, uniform interfaces. All kinds of interesting things can happen when you start using REST services. REST is extremely simple, but very, very powerful. It typically uses JSON for data transfer, but then you can use XML or other data encodings. So generally, you're gonna, in this day and age, though, you use JSON is used for the data transfer. But you will see XML uh, around as well. Sometimes you'll see both. You'll see the, the ability to query an, a REST API for either JSON or XML. So JSON, if you don't know, is a uh, JavaScript object notation. It's an open standard that creates a even more human readable than XML standard for transmitting data. And it consists basically of attribute value pairs, and it basically has replaced XML for uh, uh, over the wire communications. Um, it's a very simple protocol, very simple way of describing things, much much leaner and less chatty than um, XML, and uh, it is used very commonly with REST in combination with REST in order to communicate between two uh, modules, devices, computers, whatever, whatever you want. So what is a microservice? We'll get back into that a little bit now that you know about REST and JSON. So a microservice is a small discrete program that provides business capabilities. And what that means is it oftentimes is a REST API of some sort that will to provide a small chunk of information about your business. For instance, you might have an employee microservice that tells information about your employees, and that's it. It doesn't talk about the employee's projects, for instance, as we'll see in our demo. It doesn't talk about anything other than the employee. You can ask information about the employee using the REST API, and you'll get information back about the employee. But then if you've got customers, you know, that's a separate service. And then if you've got orders, that's a separate service. And all of these separate chunks of business logic are independently deployable so that you can take them and deploy them separately from different locations. You can deploy them from the same computer. You can deploy them from separate computers. And this makes it very friendly for the cloud. And it also makes it friendly for multiple means of language usage 
for different types of, I'm sorry, different languages that you can use to write your REST service. Say you have a team that likes to write in C++, they can write their API in C++. You have another team that likes to write C++, like Delphi. You have another team that likes to write JavaScript. It doesn't matter as long as they use the REST API and as long as they deploy a REST API. And it's almost always, as I said, HTTP requests with JSON. None of these things is centrally managed. That's one of the strengths of it, is that rather than having a monolithic application that's, that does all the talking back and forth about everything inside of the application, you have a series of smaller um, applications that produce APIs that are then a small client will com communicate with all the different microservices inside of your system and produce a single application that is serviced by multiple microservices. One way of thinking about it is, is how it's categorically opposed to monolithic applications. And this is a, a graphic taken from Martin Fowler's website that shows on the left, monolithic applications put all of the functionality into a single process and then they scale it by simply replicating the monolithic application on multiple servers. Think in terms of say, oh, I'll, I write my application and then when I want to scale it, I'll spin up multiple vi uh, virtual machines behind some type of uh, load balancing server. And so you end up with multiple copies of the monolithic application. Whereas the microservices architecture, each of the elements of your application are broken down into simple little APIs. And to scale them, you simply distribute those API services um, across servers, replicating them as desired or needed. So that the simple microservices combine into a single client that displays all the information that the microservices provide. And you can scale that much more easily by scaling the microservices as opposed to scaling a monolith. So microservices are remote. They can be used from anywhere. You can uh, pull data from computers all over the world into a single application. They're independently deployable, as I said. They have discrete, explicit interfaces. Each individual microservice has its own API that gets talked to, and then the client learns about how to, or knows how to talk to that microservice. It's organized around business needs and not technology needs. This is an important point when you talk about microservices, is that it's much more business focused. So one team will be focused on sales, another team will be focused on inventory, another team will be focused on uh, HR, for instance, or people in your company, another team will be focused on some other business aspect, as opposed to the system, the technology, such as MVC or some other technology, driving how you define your application. So a microservice will consist of all these smart, what are called endpoints, and an endpoint is the point at which the um, API exists and the REST calls are made, and dumb pipes, i.e. the transmission of the data doesn't know anything at all. It's not smart like an ESB or, or uh, some of the older technologies that are used to transmit data. HTTP is about as basic and, quote, dumb, unquote, as you can get. So microservices are decentralized, again, as in, in that they don't have to be located on the same computer in the same system. They can be spread out, the data can be spread out to different locations within your company, company or outside your company. Um, and microservices are most importantly, I'm near and dear to my heart, loosely coupled. Because they are siloed information about your business, they don't cross paths until they meet in the uh, client application itself, and they are siloed. So you can have, again, a team working on one microservice, and each microservice Say you have eight of them, and those eight microservices combine to create a single client application. You can have eight different teams or eight different people working on each individual one. You can fix each individual one as needed and, and, and whatnot. So we'll go through some principles real quick. They model services around a business domain, as we said. Um, customer management, billing, inventory, orders, and shipping all would have their own microservices. There's automation everywhere. In other words, the uh, infrastructure can be automated so that the REST clients can be uh, automatically updated as needed. If you do a 
check in on the code. You can automatically update your your uh, microservice so that uh, you can automatically test it and my, and deploy it in a continuous delivery fashion because each individual microservice is current constantly deployable and replaceable. You can hide your implementation details in a very clean and encapsulated way. Um, each service has its own bounded context and it exposes itself in a very specific way so that the implementation of that API is unknown. For instance, um, if, uh, if you know the interface of, say, Facebook, the Facebook has a nice API, but you don't care or know how that API is implemented, but you can use it nonetheless. I want to stress again that these things are decentralized. That's really important because, because each microservice is a standalone entity, it can be managed and run on its own. So you can have the sales department, a company shipping, shipping company, accounting department, the customer service, the inventory department, all managed by microservices through your IT department, but each of those individual microservices is decentralized. And they can be independently deployed, as I've mentioned. Each individual microservice can be set up on a different computer, managed on that different computer, and then more easily they can be scaled and they can load have much higher loads. Each individual microservice can manage a higher load than they could if they were all built together in a monolith application. They're customer focused. Um, each individual service is defined and designed to service its customers. Um, Amazon is very famous for this. Amazon's entire infrastructure is built on services and you, once you build a service you're responsible for maintaining it 24-7. Um, everything you see on an Amazon web page is based on top, some type of microservice built by the, an individual team at, at uh, Amazon. Netflix is another company that's very famous for um, their microservice architecture where in fact they actually aggressively bring down production services to see how resilient to, in order to challenge the team to be more resilient. So you need to make sure if you work at Netflix, your microservice is resilient and backed up and ready to be taken down at any time. Services can consume each other, but most normally they are consumed in a central client. Another thing that happens and another thing microservices do is they isolate failure. As I mentioned with Netflix, if one of the microservices go down, the entire application is not brought down. Um, your entire system is not brought down and it's very easy to bring up an alternate uh, solution or alternate microservice to fill the gap until the regular microservice can be fixed. This allows for horizontal scaling of individual services that adds redundancy and robustness in your system. The other thing that's nice about microservices is they're highly observable. You can monitor each microservice independently and check the health of each one. You get a clear picture of what parts of the system have the highest load and you can scale each individual microsystem uh, appropriately. You can check analytics for each individual microsystem to see how each is performing and how much data each is churning in order to know how to properly load balance each individual microsystem, micros, microservice, excuse me. So that's the basics of microservices. As I've said, it's really a simple solution, simple thing that uh, sounds really highfalutin with the term microservices, but basically all it is is combining REST APIs into a single client application. So I am going to go and demonstrate that with some code that I've written here. It's a very simple example of what we're talking about. I've built two microsystems here. One of them is a microsystem for employees, and those employees, um, uh, this is a this is a RAD server application that serves up information about employees. So I'm going to run this application. Whoops, I'm running the wrong one. Yep, it's not going to connect, is it? Because the services aren't running. 
So here's the employee's microservice. So I'm going to run it. It's going to bind to port 8080 and start up. And now you notice that we should be able to go to the local host for 8080. And uh, I can go forward slash employee. And it should bring forth a search for <laughs> I had an extra. Sorry, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash local host colon 8080 forward slash employee. There we go. And it brings up the data. And this in turn tells you all about the table. Um, and then it has employee information in it as well. If we scroll down past it, you can see here's Bruce Young and Kyle Lambert and Leslie Johnson, all the information. And this is just a simple HTTP request. And of course, browsers make HTTP requests all the time. So here's my HTTP request, and it brings me this data. That's all the microservice does. You ask for a specific employee, slash employee number two. It gives you that. It tells you the data. And here's the information about Robert Nelson, employee number two. And that's it. It's just simple. There's a microservice. I just created and ran a microservice. Now, um, another microservice, I'm going to minimize this, and another microservice I built is about projects. And that's about, uh, that tells me the projects that the employees are doing, excuse me, and allows me to, um, def to define the projects or grab the projects for each individual employee. And it's a completely separate application such that when I run this, I run it, you'll notice that it, I have to change the port, so it's running on a completely different port. It's a completely different application. And this one now I can go and say project. Let me get the capitalization right. Resource not found project. Oh, because I'm running on 8081. Project services running from port 8081. And here we have a list of the projects inside of the system. And if I want to know the project for a specific employee, I just push the four, tell it four, employee number four, what are the projects for employee number four? And you can see that the employee number four is attached to two different projects. Now that's all well and good. There's two microsystems here, microservices here that talk about, I'm running two of them right here, as you can see. One for the employee and one for the uh, projects that that employee uses. Now, I've built a client that uses uh, the uh, RAD server components inside of Delphi to connect to the employees at the top. And then as I select each individual employee, it's, it grabs the correct um, it uses these EMS provider components to grab the information from the project file for that specific employee. And so if I run the client, coming along, there we go. You can see that as I select each individual employee, Robert Nelson doesn't have any projects, but as I select each individual employee, the projects are done in a master detail fashion. Now, the, the thing to notice here is that the data on the top here is coming from this employee microservice, and the data on the bottom is coming from the project microservice. And you could very easily have, conceive of two different teams working on those two different packages and um, running those two different packages um, on the uh, separate machines, separate locations, but yet the client, as long as it can reach that API through the uh, network, can still run depending upon, not, not depending upon a monolithic application, but instead depending upon each individual service. And you can imagine that I could write more services depending upon the database. Um, let's take a quick look at that just to see what we might be able to run. Oops. 
here's the this is the classic employee database. So we could find out the employees' departments through a separate interface. We could find out their salaries and salary history. We could find out their sales for each employee and each department based upon individual microservices. So that's my demo. That's my presentation. Jim, are you there? I'm always here, Nick. You were always there. You were there for me last night. You're there now. Okay, so and um, you're going to put your code up on a blog post so everybody can download it and check it out or more resources? Yeah, sure. I, I can definitely do that. That would make a good blog. This would make a good blog post, so I would do that. All right, fantastic. So Colin's asking, what is the difference between microservices architecture, MSA, and service-oriented architecture, SOA? That is an excellent question. And I would say the difference is microservices are simpler. They uh, have dumb pipes instead of smart pipes. Like, for instance, an ESB communication system is a smart pipe. Um, and there's actually some debate as to whether microservices are service-oriented architecture or uh, service-oriented architecture is really microservices evolved. Um, uh, the distinction I would say most importantly would, is just the simple simplicity of microservices using HTTP and REST and JSON. Yeah, I, I, it, to me it feels like microservices are an evolution of service-oriented architecture and that service yeah. architecture is a monolithic service-oriented architecture with microservices or a non-monolithic <laughs> service-oriented architecture. That, that, was, that was my thought, but yeah. Okay. Um, oh, nobody wants to look at that face. <laughs> you said you have a face made for podcasting? I got a face made for podcasting, no doubt about it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, David's saying he wants a spec for a dedicated server to install RAD server on as far as memory requirements, etc. Oh, boy. We define that somewhere, and I don't know where it is. It's going to, um, because you're adding modules to it, it seems like that could really be very... Uh, it would depend on what you were doing with the system. And uh, RAD server itself is very lightweight. Um, it deploys into IIS, so it's just an ISAPI DLL inside of IIS as its normal deployment into production, and that's fairly lightweight. So uh, any s system that you want that we, you would normally run your web website with or a website with it would be more than adequate to run a RAD server. Now, of course, the more you start plugging things into it, into an individual instance of RAD server, the more you, uh, the more muscle you'll need, but that shouldn't be a problem. Scaling it is not a problem. Okay, so now Al's asking an interesting question. If he's running a, has Oracle database with 200 tables in it, would each table have its own service? They'd have 200 different microservices, or how, how exactly would you do that in a uh, microservices system? I would say no, you would not have a microservice for each individual table but rather you would want to focus on the business applications and the domain of the system and then um, break the microservices down into individual business units as opposed to just simply letting the technology, i.e. the tables in your database, drive the microservices, allow the domain, the business domain knowledge and, and uh, the business domain capabilities of your company to drive what needs to be a microservice. I, I'd read something that said that the uh, microservices or microservice should return conclusions and not data. So that's an interesting way to put it, yes. So you wouldn't have you wouldn't so if you're exposing the data like you I mean you, well yours is a simple example but exposing just the data from a time yeah, is is very it's technology driving the service, whereas a microservice is business centered. So you would say, well, I need to know this conclusion. This is my business need, and the microservice will be built around that business need, and yes. not 
A domain, uh, yes. Yeah, exactly. And so anytime you're, you're thinking about tables, that's technology. That's not a business need. And so if you're, you're not going to expose a table as a microservice, you're going to expose a conclusion that's drawn from some tables that is ready for business consumption. Correct. How do you manage all the microservices and addresses and ports? A client application does not want to configure all microservices separately. Can you repeat that? So uh, in your client application, when you have all these different services you're connecting to, how do you manage the, instead of having a single connection, right, you have now dozens of connections to dozens of services with different addresses and different ports. Right. Well, I guess you'd manage them the same way you'd manage the dozens of modules inside of a monolithic application. In other words, just because you have microservices serving you up data doesn't mean that you're not managing them in the same way that you would if you had them in, if those services were provided to you internally in a monolithic application. It, you, you have to communicate with the, if you have a monolithic application, you still have to communicate with the customer module. You just do it through function calls as opposed to um, a microservices based application where you do it through uh, call, function calls to a REST API. So you would probably write a interface to the REST API or a, even a class. You could even define a class that wraps up the REST API into something that's usable for you and then you would, my, and then you would um, link those together as you would normally. Yeah, I was thinking about this actually. It would seem like if you were building a lots of different clients, you could almost make a data module that exposed all your microservices through yes. a single interface. And so from your client development team's point of view, it, they're just consuming a data module, but behind the scenes, that data module is connecting to all these microservices and being able to you know, handle the rollout or horizontal scaling and all that stuff like that, so. Exactly, yes. Uh, what's the difference between RAD server plus microservices and data snap? Can you use data snap for microservices or is it a RAD Absolutely. thing? Or? Absolutely. Data snap is perfectly capable of running microservices. In fact, it's a very powerful way to do so. Um, RAD server is just very simple, clean REST APIs, whereas um, your data snap can be more complex in terms of what kind of calls can be made back and forth between the server and the client. Um, you can have regular regular methods being called uh, in data snap and it's just more powerful in that way I should and I shouldn't say more powerful it's more functional rad server is very powerful it's just power the power lays in its simplicity um, rad server basically is a rest API service microservice create, uh, tool whereas data snap is more of a remote procedure call uh, tool. Yeah, RAD server or data snap can do everything you do with RAD server. A lot of it, RAD server comes pre-built for different things. Uh, simplicity. So, but yeah, it, it, what I what Marco said that uh, data snap is an SDK for building multi-tier solutions, whereas RAD server is a multi-tier solution. <laughs> it's yeah, that's a pretty good way to put it too. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So does. Um, does RAD server support microservice monitoring in any way, or does that have to be done by hand? Um, yeah, my, a RAD server has analytics built into it, and you can certainly build your own modules that enhance those analytics. Um, one of the things that RAD server does that we don't offer microservice, we should have a webinar on the capabilities of the back end capabilities of RAD server, which um, do have the ability to do analysis and analytics on the individual um, modules that are plugged into it. I was just making a note of uh, Red Services Red Server uh, backend. Here we go in my webinar planning table. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. Uh, in an ideal scenario, would each microservice have a separate database? Is that is that, is that right? Um, well, I don't know if that's ideal or not, but it certainly could be the truth. 
and it could be um, could be that each individual backend database, each microservice has its own backend, or it could talk to multiple. You know, two microservices could share one database, and three microservices could share another database. That could certainly be the case. Um, that would totally depend upon your architecture and your needs of the business and how you want to set things up on the back end. Yeah, so you could, if you had like a, I'm thinking if you had, I've worked at companies that have, you know, these huge databases that service everybody, all the departments, but then each department's going to pull their own conclusions from that database, which they will then yeah. share through their microservice. It's a good way to put it. Um, Very eloquent this morning, Jim. Well, thank you. Uh, so I see people asking about Linux. Can you do RAD server microservices on Linux? Yes, you can. You can? Is yes, you can. Coming or is that available today? That is coming in the next release. Gotcha. Godzilla. Codenamed Godzilla. Keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes peeled. Get your credit cards ready. <laughs> That's right. Or get on a subscription now. And get on a big subscription like now and it will magically appear. That's right. It'll be like Christmas. Exactly. <laughs> Christmas all year round. That's right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, if my location... Uh, let's see. Oh, this is two questions. Over, or one question over two. What to do about session state? The client has a login or some other specific state that affects the output of the service. For example, if your location determines how to handle the input. Each individual REST request can be accompanied by login credentials. Um, I'm not sure what they're asking beyond that. Do you have an idea, Jim? Um, I'm guessing it's just how to have state, I'm, I'm guessing, has to do with what kind of it's getting at. Well, that, that's part of, that's an important part is that they're stateless. Microservices are stateless. REST API requests are stateless. So it would be up to the client to maintain any state that they wanted to maintain. Yeah, if you needed to, I mean, you could have a token that was started for some sort of, so if you wanted to have a lot of things associated to a certain state, and I'm doing air quotes here you can't see, you could have some sort of token that was passed back and forth between services, but uh, it did, like like you said, the, then the the client is maintaining the state, not the server is not maintaining the state. That's correct. Um, is RAD server available in uh, inter Delphi ten point one update two enterprise edition? Yes, it is. You can do development for RAD server in the enterprise division, enterprise. SKU. Um, I'm pretty sure it was available in Seattle as well, but you need the enterprise SKU to do development, and then you need a license for RAD server to do deployment. Yeah. So it, that's a real important thing. If people ask about this, you, if you have enterprise, I think it, yeah, Seattle or uh, Berlin, then you have RAD server, uh, de developer server. So you can Correct. create a new EMS module. And it will deploy against the RAD server development server, but then you can. Yeah, my that. demos were running those little the windows you saw with the with the log of the calls coming in. That was the dev server. Yes, the dev server. But then you contact sales to get a license to deploy it. And I think there's a promo going on right now. If you're not on uh, Berlin, I think there's a promo around RAD server right now. So. Talk to sales. I think there is too, and I have to mention it. They they have always have all sorts of great promos going on. So, um, can you can your RAD server deployment run on the Azure cloud? Absolutely, absolutely no reason why I wouldn't be able to do that. It'll be particularly easy once Linux is available. Azure's Microsoft's cloud. I don't, I don't know if they have Linux versions of that. They but. do. They do, they do huh? have Linux servers. That's right. Microsoft Absolutely. loves Linux now. I forgot. Microsoft <laughs> loves Linux. How about security? Do, is HTTPS supported by RAD server? It is. It is. And, uh, there's complete certificate support and everything like that. All that goodness is there. So microservices is a comment here that seems a lot easier to maintain and much more flexible than uh, other approaches. 
That's exactly the point, yes. One microservice is easier to manage and it's basically it's the decoupling of your monolithic application. That's basically what it boils down to. Yep. And we all know how much I love decoupling. <laughs> uh, Colin's saying, I guess... Can't get enough decoupling. I guess the evolution seems to be the enterprise integration architecture apps plus the enterprise service bus. Next service-oriented architecture gains services plus SOAP, now microservices, lightweight service plus REST. There you go. Yeah. It, th yeah, this is really, it's a f kind of a, a philosophy, a design philosophy evolution of some of the other things we've talked about. Exactly, yes. Uh, could you create a service-oriented architecture that redirects only request each specific microservice so, in such a way that the ser SOA manages the microservices and allows upscaling and distribution, or would you disagree with such an approach? That's an interesting question. I would argue that you don't want to overcomplicate things and that you want to keep each individual microservice siloed and thus trying to manage them with some type of service-oriented architecture in the background would probably be something you'd want to avoid. Um, but uh, unless I'm misunderstanding the question. Yeah, I, I think technically you could do it, but yeah, I think that you'd be you'd lose some of the advantages of microservices. I, I, I could so, see yeah. you could have a situation where you had a uh, maybe a microservice dispatch dispatcher, right? So if you had a really large implementation where you had you know, a lot of horizontal scaling going on, you could contact the dispatcher and say, you know, what services are available, what's their IP addresses and ports, you know, and you could say, oh well. The shipping microservice is available across all these addresses here, right? And you could pick one from there or, you know, load balancing. I guess load balancing probably be the way to go or something like that. So you could have a directory of some sort. But I think once you start running everything through a single bus for a service rendered architecture, I think you start to lose some of that flexibility. Yeah, there's that sort of defeats the purpose, right? Yeah. Let's see. So the... Uh, would the client it seems like the client would be a lot more complicated compared to a monolithic application for if it's service oriented build? I think by definition it's less complicated. Um, a monolithic application is a very complex application. The comp and uh, it contains all the business logic, all the processing, all the database access. In this case, the client does nothing more than make rest calls and combine those rest calls into business functionality which, in my mind, is a simpler client. Yeah, it, it, it would be simpler than if the yeah, if it, each service returns a conclusion, it would be simpler than building all those conclusions yourself within the client application. Agreed, yes. Uh, so, question about securing over, when, over the Internet, that would be HTTPS, and then you could also do uh, logins, which is all supported by RAD server. Correct. How, does it make sense that microservices would communicate with each other? I think so. Um, I don't see why one microservice couldn't call another microservice to get some of the data that it needs. Yeah, I, I, certainly possible. Yep. I don't Probably think we desire. Yeah, exactly. I don't think you're going to have all the microservices aren't going to necessarily be monitoring each other to see what's going on. That's kind of that starts to be unloosely coupled, but if you have to have one microservice calls another microservice to get some data, then that still makes sense. And of course, each of those, if like say one microservice calls two other microservices, those microservices are decoupled and siloed, so it all works together. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so if I have RAD Studio Architect, do I need a separate license for RAD Server? Yes, you do. Unless you unless you take advantage of one of the promotions I think we're using right now, which I don't know the details of, but you might want to check with sales to see if there's a promotion available for you. Yeah, you have you have the developer edition, but in order to deploy it, you do need the additional license. Here's the uh, 
I'll put this in the chat window here. The current special offers we have going on right now. Um, yeah, if you get Enterprise or Architect, you get a RAD server license for free. So, ten, and ten percent off Enterprise or Architect. So, if you're not on the latest version, act now because not only do you get that great offer, but you get the upgrade to the new release that's coming with Linux support. Okay. Okay, so what is the why would you use RAD server in building microservices building just versus building it all from scratch? What does RAD server give you out of the box as it were? RAD server gives you analytics, user management, security, um, HTTP functionality, super easy creation of new REST uh, API endpoints and uh, so, for instance, the two REST API endpoints that I built for the application, I built those two in 10 minutes. Very easy to build. I mean, they're simple. Granted, they're very simple. But they're also very, very easy to build. And it's just like building a regular data module that exposes itself as a REST API. Yep. Does if you want to build it from scratch, you can. There's nothing stopping you. But RAD server provides a terrific amount of value. Yeah, it does. I, I've done uh, demos of RAD server. I, I just recently did a presentation. I did a little demo of RAD server, and I came up with someone came up afterwards, and they're like, "Oh, I've been working on a building my own architecture, a REST architecture, and you know, I'm this many months into it, but RAD server looks really, really good." And they asked a few questions about it. They're like, "Okay, I'm throwing everything else out and just using RAD server because it's so much easier yeah. than what I've been doing." <laughs> and they were personally had a lot of time in it, so yeah. Yeah, I personally wouldn't think about um, building a REST API today in Delphi without RAD server. Yep. Does RAD server support OAuth 2 or some sort of similar standards? It absolutely does, yeah. You can do that through uh, the REST components, um, and it allows you to, to it allows you to make REST calls. Well, RAD server doesn't do that. Well, what am I trying to say? It, it's yes. authentication. I don't know that it's OAuth 2. I uh, you know what? I don't know. Because OAuth, OAuth is where you're doing like a federated login, right? Mm -hmm. So OAuth is where it's like um, you're logging into a service, but you're not giving that service your username and password. So, for example, if I wanted to let... Uh, Bill and Ted's excellent web service access my Facebook account or authenticate me through my Facebook credentials. I don't want to give Bill and Ted's excellent web service my username and password directly. So what o OAuth does is it lets Bill and Ted's excellent web service call Facebook, then Facebook prompts me for my username and password, and then I give it to Facebook because I trust Facebook with that username and password. And then Facebook says goes back to Bill and Ted and says, Yes, they are who they say they are, and you now have this level of access to Facebook at their account level. And so it's Correct. it doesn't yeah. really make sense for uh, RAD Server to do that because RAD Server, you are building a solution that would uh, be authenticating a user directly. Now, if you needed to connect to a third-party service, I guess I'm not sure if you could do a OAuth. If you want to, if you want to make a make a REST call to a third-party OAuth service, you can do that using the REST components and yeah. the OAuth authentication. And the REST demo that comes with Red Studio uh, shows you how to do that. So now, can you be a little more specific about what the difference between a microservice and a REST service is? Well, they're very, very closely aligned. A microservice normally uses REST to um, do its work, but it doesn't have to. I mean, it, you could use um, some type of direct TCP IP connectivity if you wanted to, just regular pipes, any number of connectivity solutions. But it's just that uh, HTTP and um, JSON combined are so powerful and easy to use that uh, that's the common way to do it. Um, I would say that 
REST is the logical layer, and I'm trying to think of the terms from the, the different layers. REST is the sort of the business, the, I can't think of the terms, I'm sorry, my brain is fried. <laughs> you had a call in the middle of the night. REST, I REST, did have a call in the middle of the night. REST is the protocol, if you will, and if you say protocol to a REST developer, yes, they get thank you. all twitchy. But if, if, if basically microservices is a architecture built on top of REST, if I guess you could say. So, microservices is the term to describe a means of connectivity, connectivity or a means of architecting your application where REST is the implementation detail. Yes. There you go. That's it. Yes. Okay, so here's this is a good question. If, if there's millions of records in one table, how do you manage the get all method with RAD server? Is there a property like paging? Um, I don't believe so. I think you'd have to manage that yourself. Millions of records in a table is always a problem, no matter how how you how you slice it. Yeah. It, with it, it, if you're doing from a RAD server point of view, there's different ways you could tackle it. From microservices, you're most likely not going to want to return a millions of records because then you're returning data and not a conclusion. That's a lot of and yeah, that's a lot of JSON. It could be. Yeah. So if you're wanting, if you're doing a microservice, your microservice should return the conclusion of those million records and then let someone pull individual records possibly. But again, it should be conclusions, not data. If you're thinking about... Yeah, you definitely want to pull your cards on the table. Records. Sorry. Oh, who's that? <laughs> it's my dogs. It's the, the, the washing so. machine. Oh my goodness. Are we having a crisis at the Keith, the Keith house? Yes, the washing machine is running and the dogs are freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you talk a little about RAD server versus other backends? RAD server is the best backend there is. That's right. It's the best. <laughs> Sorry. Whoops, there's my calendar. No, it, it, you know, RAD server is a backend, um, but if you're a Delphi developer, RAD server is the best backend to use. Yeah, um, I confess I'm not familiar with other backends. I uh, spend my time working in Delphi, so I uh, know that Delphi and Red Server work together like peas and carrots. Peas and carrots, yes. <laughs> A little Forrest Gump reference for you. <laughs> A REST service is like a box of chocolates. <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> Uh, uh, how would you describe the difference between service-oriented architecture with a plug-in system such that each logic is decoupled in comparison to a microservice in each solution situation the management of the decoupled code looks similar? They are similar. Um, the architecture is similar. The implementation is probably different. And microservices is a, a much simpler, leaner, cleaner solution than using some type of service-oriented architecture framework like ESB. <laughs> Craig is apparently online and made a comment about backends that I'm not going to repeat. <laughs> That's probably a good idea. <laughs> apparently there are quite a few backends out there with some positive features to them. Uh, let's see. Are compression components in RAD server to lower payload for data package, large data package, so compressing the data that's being transmitted? Yeah, you wrote a blog post about that. Yep. Yeah, it's it's because Red Server plugs into IIS. It's all IIS handles that compression automatically. So the all the secure HTTPS and compression is all done automatically through uh, through IIS and decouples it because it's and also because it's using the native HTTP socket components. It automatically decompresses and decrypts all that automatically on the client side. It's just handled for you like magic. Um, how easy is it to, de to couple RAD server user authentication with LDAP knowing about all actual users in domain? Um, right now, not possible, but that's on the roadmap. Um, there's an active directory demo that comes with RAD server, so they might look at that and might be able to explain that. 
uh, on the roadmap we have the uh, to uh, we have we have on our roadmap the adding the capability to use um, Active Directory as well as Kerberos. Yeah, you could. It seems like you could with you could use uh, use it now, but having it built in would be a great improvement. Uh, we have two layer systems based on replicated Oracle databases and 100 plus complex applications developed in Delphi on geographically separate sites with different net bandwidth. What's your experience about using RAD server as far as performance goes? Uh, it's very lightweight, it's very fast, and performance is good. Um, it's it, it, it's it's hard to say because I don't know your system other than what you've explained, but one of the strengths of microservices is it's very fast, very lightweight, very clean. And yeah. so it's also decomposable. In other words, you can build one microservice and then have your application use that one microservice and then build another microservice and have your application use that microservice. And you can slowly but surely decompose a monolithic application into a microservice-based application, step-by-step. Step. Exactly. That's what I was going to say is that you could introduce a microservice. That's, that's actually a really good thing because uh, you don't have to switch over wholesale completely to a new system. You could just introduce a new feature as a microservice and then just slowly do it over time. Right. Now you talk about microservices being easy to test, but it seems like having many services would make testing more complicated. Um, I'm not sure how. It's the same number of, it's the same amount of functionality just siloed into individual uh, microservices. If you have a monolithic application, you still have to test with 20 different modules. You still have to test all 20 modules. If you have a microservices based application, 20 different microservices, you have to test 20 microservices. So I'm not sure it seems more complicated. Yeah, if you think it's instead of having, you don't have one test for a monolithic service and one test for each microservice. You would test each feature and function, and if that feature and function is, if you have a hundred features and functions in a monolithic, that's hundreds of tests, and if you have it over a hundred different microservices, it's still the same number of tests. You possibly may have one additional test. Is the microservice running? <laughs> but it, that's a good test. Yeah. But then everything else is going to be functionality test. Are there any RAD server C++ demos available? Or are they all Delphi? Um, I confess I don't know. Uh, you can search around Code Central or on the Internet. Um, I don't know C++, uh, so I can't write a C++ demo. But I'll see if I can get David Millington to write one for me. There, I think there are. It, it seems like, for everyone, I should say. It seems like we've done a C++ RAD server presentation previously. The RAD server, because it handles so much of the stuff for you, and I know it's supported by C++, it's not that complicated to get a demo going. But, uh, yeah, we, we, if we don't have one, we'll get, get one written. So with the uh, upcoming Godzilla release, in Linux support, does that mean that RAD server is going to support Apache? Yes. And we're going to have the replay. Yes, we will have the replay and the code that Nick wrote available for download in the slides. A lot of questions. I have a hard stop, by the way. Yeah, we're, I think we're almost done. Okay. <laughs> uh, are you making... Sorry. Aren't you making your examples using RAD Studio directly? So RAD Server is a feature of RAD Studio. So yeah, he's using RAD Studio, uh, but RAD Server, the deployment of RAD Server requires a separate license, but it is a feature of RAD Server Studio. Yeah, here, let me, uh, let me just show that again. These, these two applications here that are serving up the data are the EMS development server, and that comes with RAD Studio. Okay, so microservices can communicate with each other, 
Um, would it be possible to communicate from a data snap to a RAD server via microservice? I don't see why not. Yeah. 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 Microservices is a architectural philosophy, I guess, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. And so whether you're doing that with data snap, RAD server, uh, web broker, whatever, those all can talk to each other. It's just, it's how that, it's that architectural philosophy is implemented. And it looks like we're done and it is two minutes from top of the hour. So Sweet. any last words? A lot of then? good questions. A lot of good questions. No, I just, uh, I'd encourage people to explore RAD server and check it out. Um, if you don't have the enterprise version, we have some upgrade specials to the enterprise version, I believe. Yes. And uh, it's definitely worth looking at. Um, you could build your own if you want to. Uh, I have a lot of people that say, well, I'll just build my own. I'm like, okay, go right ahead and see how long it takes you to uh, provide everything that RAD server provides for you. And uh, uh, it's pathetically easy to build a basic RAD server um, plugin, and then it's no harder than building your own data module. Think of the work that you do in a data module to provide information to your client application. Uh, for that data module, and that's basically what you're doing in Red Server. Is you're taking a data module and turning it into a, a REST API service. Fantastic. All right, thanks a lot, Nick, and I'll get the uh, replay up available soon. Uh, all right, thanks, Nick. Bye. All right, bye-bye.